Wednesday night, in fact, if you have a chance, go back and I've already listened to it once because it was profound and it came out of last Sunday, which I'll address for a moment. But on Wednesday night, while we were worshiping, the Lord said to me, we honor you, we honor, said to me over us, we honor you, we honor you. And all you have done and become, Jesus has become things by bringing ourselves to you. You know, and that came out of where I knew we were talking about the hour of prayer that the Lord has initiated, returned, the return of the hour of power. And I, Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, it kind of unveiled, and I was still in jet lag, but it, about 4.30 in the morning on that Sunday, last Sunday, I'm waking up in dream state, and I'm having dreams from the Lord. And I'm dreaming about mansions, which he was speaking of with affection about the abiding prayer life, where he, she, we, dwell, we abide in Jesus, his words abide in us. Then I was thinking about chosen, and he was speaking affectionately about it as the intercessory prayer, where we come in agreement with the promises of God and the work, the plan of God over us, and in this specific with the chosen's over things that God asked me to do, and we rally together and go forward in that. And I felt the Lord saying, "Okay, Wednesday, you're going to you're going to release blessing to both those uh, concepts: the abiding prayer, the intercessory prayer." And then in the middle, at, at, toward the end of the service, as I, I don't know, I, all of a sudden, I made a confession. And if you were here, you remember. I confessed that some time ago, I had come up with the idea that if I only asked people to pray for 15 minutes a day, that they would, by their 15 minutes of prayer, soon find that prayer was indeed life, the lifeline, the life-giving practice and would rise to the prayer of an hour a day. When I first got saved, and ever since I've been saved, I pray more than an hour a day. But, and there was a time I was taught we should pray an hour a day. And the, and the, 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 the pattern of that is found in Matthew at the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus enters in the garden and he says to his three disciples, Peter, James, and John, he says, my soul is at the point of death. I am like in such distress. Stay here and watch with me. And then he goes off and he prays for an hour and basically he prays the prayer of the surrendering of the soul unto the point of death, to the purpose of which he had been sent. Father, if there's any way that this cup can pass, let it pass, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And he returns and finds the disciples sleeping. And Luke tells us they were sleeping because of sorrow. I don't think there would ever have been a more demonic, more heavy stated, condemning, hopeless atmosphere than that night. Because of all the hell was in its intentionality. It felt like it was actually going to somehow swallow the Son of God. And the, the time was right, the mood was right, the multitude was getting agitated. And, and so this atmosphere which Jesus was sustaining his life atmosphere all through the evening prior to the Gethsemane, but finally he's in that place where he's having to switch and surrender to, the, to what was not hell winning, but God's intent, which is to crush his son. And God, he knew Father was going to crush him and put him to grief. And he was to be an offering, his soul, for sin. And the Father had assured Jesus, and Jesus, we understand in Isaiah 53, was that there would be then a, uh, that the seed, us, would come forth. The multiplication of sons would be born. And that would bring, begin a whole new era and a whole new beautiful place. But in this moment, only one knew it, Jesus. And he's surrendering as much as he, he can yield to what would be the most, you know, horrific idea, your father killing you and putting his wrath upon you. The only thing close to that was a long time ago, Abraham on the same mountain brought up his son Isaac and bound him with rope and placed him on, on an altar that he had built 
and was ready to slay him with the, with the sword and then offer him as a burnt offering. And the Hebrews tells us that when Abraham was doing that, he had faith that, well, God promised that out of this son would come forth the seed, yet he is not yet married, he's just a teenager. But that must mean that if that's the case, then God will just have to raise him from the ashes. See, God asks of things from us to surrender the stuff of us that would hinder the, the confidence in him in the middle of crises. So often he starts to ask of us to surrender in the beginning part of our journey, which is prayer, a huge part of that. Jesus returns after an hour of prayer, agonizing prayer, and finds the disciples sleeping. And he says, what? This is a literal translate, this literal quote from Matthew. What? Could you not watch with me one hour? It's like, if ever the soul of a man needed the friends to come alongside, this was the moment. And he'd asked them, and they couldn't. And he says, you know, the spirit's willing, but the, the flesh is weak. Pray that you don't enter into temptation. So he was opening the door and making clear for all of us that the way out of the temp testings we're in is through prayer. He goes away, prays the same prayer. Sometimes a prayer isn't, is, it's, it's as much of us processing life unto God to which we can fully release it to God. And so he prays the same prayer for an hour, which is in essence, if it, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. If there's another way, love to do it but I want to surrender to the will of my Father. That's why I came, to do your work. Comes home back, and the disciples are sleeping. And this time he doesn't even wake them up. Just walks back to his place of prayer. And Luke tells us in, that, that when he went to gar in the garden, he went to the place. See, he had a place in the garden that he'd pray often. This was not his first time in the garden. He, this was, and he went back to his place. And he prays a third time, so three hours. And finally he wake. the Bible says in, in Luke's account also that an angel came and strengthened him. There's something in the end, for us, especially for any of us who have been laboring through difficult seasons, there is an angelic strengthening that's coming that is met in prayer. The two times Jesus is strengthened by an angel is on the Mount of Temptation after 40 days of prayer and confronting the devil and overcoming him by the abiding word and here in the Gethsemane. And in these two moments, the angels come and they strengthen them. I believe that that strengthening was an outer man to an inner man encounter, just as the Holy Spirit coming out of the glory strengthens us from the inner man to the outer man. There was like a, to collect the whole man to, ever, to, to go and face this, this mob that was about to arrest him and then be in total, absolute clarity and confidence and, and peace. It's enough to tell his disciples, put the sword down, we're not going this direction. And he says in Matthew, he says, how could the scriptures be fulfilled? So he had such a sense that he was inside of eternal, the eternal word of God, which all of us are. I don't think any of our lives could be outside of Scripture, right? Even if we're proving the Scripture, you know, as Paul said, it can do nothing against the truth but for the truth. All I'm doing is proving truth, wherever I am. So Jesus speaks these words about, I have to surrender to the Father's will that's inside Scripture, for to this purpose I've come. He's, he's got the victory. Nobody else knows what to do. And those words cause the disciples to break connection. When, he, when they spoke something that seemed to be so out of the box, when he said, I, am, I, can, get, I can get angels, I can get thousands and thousands of angels. This is not an issue for me to get out of this problem. But, I'm not, but for this reason I came. And the scripture must be fulfilled. And the disciples, the grid, they're just like, you can just see they went, just, and they just ran. Because they had not and could not. Jesus already prophesied, you can't follow me where I'm going now. So the hour of power, the hour of prayer, is found there in Scripture. That's the closest thing we could, you know, give it uh, a reason for it. I don't have, I don't, oh, there I see over there. 
Okay, I'm used to seeing a clock up there, but it's only a zero, 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 but there is a clock there. So all week long, as, as I ended the service, I said, I'm, I'm sorry, and I know now God's given me faith for an hour of prayer, to call for an hour of prayer. To call and ask and open the door for every one of us to pray an hour. To enter into a practice of a daily prayer for an hour. Not legalistically, not bound. Thursday, I got up. My schedule, I had to go to do a lot of appointments, meetings in the morning, which is my normal time of prayer. And it never let up, and I never prayed that day. But I didn't freak out, because my life is not by what I do, it's by who he is. Prayer is not something to make God impressed with me. Prayer is something to connect me to the God who delivers me. <laughs> but without an hour of prayer, I don't believe we can go in the place that God's going. Every moment, every transition in time is, is linked to a prayer season. And Jesus began his ministry in prayer. He closed his ministry in prayer. The church began its calling in prayer, 10 days, and then came the, 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 the Holy Spirit, and we'll close the, air, the, the season, the, the, the era, the, the millennial, in prayer. So anyway, the good news, this is the good news. There's faith for prayer. And God's going to connect you in your prayer time. And let me talk about what prayer looks like now. Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 and 5 which we can't go through. When I pray, I do not pray to fix myself or get God to fix stuff. I pray to connect me to the eternal one who's fixed everything. When I pray, I begin with Jesus. I do not get to Jesus. I begin. And when I pray, I begin with Jesus in the holiest of places. Within a minute, I am there. By faith, yes, but soon, every rest of me catches up, and I have the experience. Prayer is meant to create, place me in a position to experience the victory that Jesus has won. It, it, is, it is a surrender of the soul. It is by far the most yielding posture a man or woman can take, is to surrender to the resurrection of Christ. Not to petition him to come into our miserable state and deliver us from the stuff we're in. That we're in, he knows it, he will do it. But what he wants us to do is to leave that limitation and enter into the victory and the triumph that he has accomplished, which is shared powerfully in the word. In Hebrews 3, it tells us that we are his house. It's, we are his house. If we hold fast the confidence and boasting of hope firm unto the end. If we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of hope firm unto the end. We are the house of God. So then it says, he is our apostle, high priest of our confession. And it says, today if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. So what I've learned in, in, the, in, in, in becoming like Jesus is that I have to keep hearing his voice that, that calls me out of where I would be kept in into where I've been called to. If I'm called, I have to be called. So I have to hear his voice. So it says, and it's repeated three times out of Psalm 95, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the day of rebellion. Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the day of rebellion. Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the day of rebellion. So the hardened heart is where the unbelief builds. So we believers d delivered from sin joined to Christ, can become very much unbelieving believers. Because in the, in the context, chapter 3 and 4, unbelief or rebellion is the, is the imagery not of ignorance in unbelief, but of willfulness in unbelief. Have you ever gone through a season where you put your faith out there, you had an experience that was not what you expected, and people promised you stuff that nobody delivered? And you start to think, you know what, I'm just not going out there anymore. That may be wisdom, but unfortunately over time it makes us enter more into hardened hearts of unbelief. 
It's not that God doesn't want us to get smarter as we go along and not be so gullible and naive. God knows. But childlikeness is, is one that is still responsive to the, to the whisper. And not to let the heart get hardened, but to go, wait a minute. Uh, wow, I'm going. Yet, the hardened heart, the unbelieving heart, happens through the circumstances of life. And so it says then in, at the end of, as the end of chapter 4, is that uh, there's, there's a rest that's waiting for the people of God. And if we can enter the rest, then we can cease from our labors. Or as, when we enter our rest, we stop our own striving, our own idioms. And we come into the rest of God. And then it tells us literally how to do it. it and it is the basis of the mansion's message. And it's the basis of practice. And so I'd like to just lead us, show you this little piece in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. I just, I just want you to, the becoming prayer, the, the, the entering into, the world of who Jesus is, is so vibrant and so full of life that the beckoning of us to come up is, is, is the means for everything we're seeking him to do down here. So it's not trying to pull us into a, oh, leave, you know, I don't want you to deal with your stuff. I want you to come and worship me. I don't care what your problems are. Give me some praise. That may be what you hear him sounds like he's saying. But it's really, I need to calibrate you back to my victory because my victory is the victory you're already looking for. My triumph is the one you need to have find expression and you will not find it in the circumstances, but you will find it in intimacy, into worship, into prayer. So it says, therefore, being diligent. This, that's uncalibrated. Brian, you guys, between services. I don't, Tim, Kim, well, that's, we lost a piece of the screen on this one. Air for. <laughs> so I'm going to read my Bible from there. Therefore, let us therefore be diligent to enter the rest. Lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience or unbelief as synonyms for the word of God. He's not changing the subject now. He's actually telling us the means to and to rest. For the word of God is living, powerful, and is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This is so huge. Hebrews 10, 19 tells us that we come immediately with boldness by the blood through the veil of the flesh and our high priest into the holy of holies. And then we begin to draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. We have an experience of recalibration. And then we grab hold of our confession of hope and don't let it go away for anything because he's faithful. That's prayer. That's the practice of prayer on any level in every situation. Jesus, who he is, what he's accomplished, and what he's saying to us, and holding ourselves in agreement with who Jesus is and what Jesus said, and staying there into those, until those truths begin to affect us emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and recalibrate us to that, what we're, what we're be declaring. The way that practically happens is the scripture is like what here it's called logos, the word of God. It is the conversation of God. It is the entirety of the subject. It's the full Bible. Rhema is that specific spoken word of God. This is the entirety of the Bible. The word was became flesh, the logos. And when I, when I go to scripture, I, when I go to pray, I do not pray from my place. I, spent, I wasted years praying from my place. I don't pray from America's place. I don't, pray, I don't pray one prayer anymore that thinks that I have to do anything or we need to do something for God to do something. It is a backwards thinking. It's an Old Testament model that when Jesus had not yet come and the shadow was, the sac sacrifices specifically for this, for that, for that, for this. Yeah, but now Jesus is everything for everything and done once and for all 
for all time. So I have to now calibrate myself to that truth, which is a huge truth because the church doesn't teach. The, the, the man is a religious being through the fall and we like to have things we can point to. I did, therefore God has to do. When in fact now it's all that what Jesus did, that's the reason why God is doing. So it's a recalibration. So the word of God starts recalibrating me. I come in and it, it's, it's living, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It starts to separate my spirit from my soul. It starts to delineate. Whoa, you know, that's a pretty soulish emotion I'm carrying. Well, I'll get rid of that one. Don't think I want to keep that. I want to release it. Is it need forgiveness? Do I need to uh, undo, uh, you know, a curse off of my own thinking? Do I need to get out of the accusation? Stop listening to the condemnation? The Word of God does that. And not only does it do that, it separates the inner man, the outer man, the, the joints and the marrow. The marrow is where life comes from, the heart. The joints are what connects us to be a functional body and discerns the very thoughts and intents of my heart. So, again, I don't read the scriptures. The scriptures do not condemn. The scriptures do not condemn because Jesus has been condemned and buried and raised from the dead, and ever lives to make intercession. So you got, there's some things we have to listen to, because if we pray for an hour, and the prayer starts from an Old Testament mindset of what we do is what's making the difference, versus what we do is to attain, to, to, to connect to what made the difference. Prayer is calibrating me back to truth, bringing me back to the victory. And all of truth and all victory is Jesus Christ. Nowhere else, nothing else, it's, I've tried it all, it's nothing else. Jesus Christ and him crucified and him buried and him raised from the dead. He ascended and now seated at the right hand of majesty high, my, uh, my high priest. And beholding and connecting. So I come and I connect. And the word of God is the things that God, the conversation he's currently having with us. The wonderful moments where we hear and we respond and we sense that the Lord's doing something. That's what we bring with us into prayer. And we experience in his presence. And we let the word of God have final say. Not my will, but your will. Not my emotions, but your emotions. Not my mindset, but your mindset. Not the way I feel, but the way you are in, yeah, sharing your feelings here in scripture. While we do that, something radical is happening, and it's so funny Petey picked that song today, because it says there is no creature hidden from his sight. There's no creation, there's nothing. We, we, uh, uh, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. This is a powerful imagery. Naked is nude. It means no clothes. It's, Nothing covering you. Open is vulnerability. It literally is the picture of the jugular vein of an animal about to be sacrificed. So in prayer, for prayer, for rest to come, prayer opens us to a, a place of nakedness and vulnerability. And again, the nakedness and the vulnerability is because we are, re we are releasing ourselves from our resource, our righteousness, our rights. It's, I ought to. I work so hard for you. After all these years, all those arguments are falling off because they are no argument. They mean nothing but what Jesus did. And the word of God is separating. We're, re we're, ex we're, we're experiencing to whom we must give an account. The word account is the word logos. Get that. I, I enter in, I, 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 want to, I want rest. So I'm passing through the word, the logos of God. And at the end, I'm going to have a logos that I'm going to give back to God, a conversation. We are in, we're, we're conversing in and back and forth within the word of God. And my yieldedness to the word of God and what it says over me. So, Lord, I want to enter into an hour of prayer. I'm, I am now receiving the call to an hour of prayer. I have prayed at hours different times, but now I, I surrender myself to the hour of prayer to receive what the hour of prayer is for me to receive to know you. 
I come under the banner that the, our pr- power is to encounter Jesus Christ and to calibrate my life to the truth of who you are. So I, I, I set myself to experience Jesus, to know you, to enter into you, to let the word of God. It includes praise. It includes so much scripture discovery. The scripture discovery is powerful. Inside the word, where you're allowing it to kind of go, well, you're talking to me. Not like this specific promise, like a rhema, but you're just, we're talking, we're having conversation. And then as I'm in this conversation, I'm realizing, wow, I don't need to hide because I'm already naked. And I don't need to protect myself because I'm already totally in vulnerability. And that's okay because my conversation that I want to bring back to you is how I put my my trust in you. That's the praise of the glory of his inheritance as we trust. So then it says, uh, seeing or recognizing, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. So think of Jesus in this moment, going through the word, recognizing my vulnerability, that now Jesus Christ is the high priest. He is the one that makes my access accessible. He is the one who brings my conversation and brings it into completeness. He is the one who is coming to my aid in my weakness in through the strength of his victory. And so the thing that the the thing that we are to hold is our confession. Our confession is what we've heard God say over us, what he's speaking to us about our life and our future. It is the profession of our hope. It is the promises. It is, it is that logos, that conversation. So now that I'm in, or now that I'm practicing the word and recognizing vulnerability and agreeing, there Jesus is as my high priest. He is the one that gives me total access, authorization, and experience. Uh, the capacity to experience God because of what he's accomplished, who he is. And all he says, Steve, just, just, just don't get out of agreement with me. I know sometimes it's hard. I know sometimes the circumstances of life are so convoluted and so con- uh, contradictory, but just stay in agreement with my word and what I've spoken. Just hold my confession. Just, I know it's hard, but you don't know I know because I held my father's confession over me. I never broke agreement. And I had to pray all the time to keep that place in that that place. See, right now, in every one of our lives, God's trying to illuminate Jesus Christ in us in some fashion. And he's doing it by his spirit and with his word. And with his word and by his spirit. And what we're doing is placing ourselves in a posture where we we separate ourselves so we can have experience with the Holy Spirit and the word. And as we have Holy Spirit and Word experience, then Jesus starts to step in to what his now present ministry is of intercession. And intercession is that he steps into our current setting and he starts to recollect us to truth. He, he reinterprets circumstance. He brings us back under scripture. He just is masterful and he's kind. He's kind. We do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are yet without sin. He's kind. We don't have to hide. He knows what we did, what we didn't do, what we won't do, what we can't do. He knows our propensity to sin. He knows our bad habits. He knows our fears and our anxious ways. He knows our soulish ways. He knows more about us than we'll ever know about ourselves. And he's kind. And he sympathizes and empathizes and comes alongside. Oh, this is what the hour of power is. This is why you can get up after an hour of prayer and be recalibrated to face life no matter what life brings and just say, well, whatever. I will not disengage from the one that I've been engaged to. Therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace. Therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help time and need. Therefore, come boldly. So, Prayer is meant to have an experience where mercy and grace recollect themselves around us. Recollect and reconnect in Christ in what he has done and through his word and by his spirit. And all of that is rest. All of that is rest. 
Jesus said, if you take my yoke upon me, you'll learn of me, and you'll find rest for your soul. No different, just a little more language here to help us understand this hour of power. So I'd like to pray over us. Uh, first off, that God would give you the word of the Lord concerning your, our, your prayer life. I believe the Lord really wants to awaken living stones. People that, are, that have come alive in the glories of who Jesus Christ is. Experientially, that you're carrying your own conversation with God. And it's not a conversation of a to-do list, either that you must do or a to-do list that he must do. It's not a honeydew. It's a beholding becoming. And where the satisfaction. I declare to us that if satisfaction comes from Jesus Christ, not from ministry, not from money, not from achievement, not in marriage, not in the country you live or the prayers you got answered. It comes in this one union, communion, and delight. Contentment is great gain. And it will not release gain everywhere. But gain does not release contentment. The satisfaction. And prayer primarily is to be satisfied in Jesus. If you're satisfied in Jesus, you can go face the angry mob. You can go face the awful marriage. You can go face the struggling financial situation that doesn't seem to surrender to your prayers. You can go face a body that's pain because all of a sudden you're, fa you're seeing the face of the one who brings all things under him and seems to eclipse everything because he's life. And when the satisfaction can be sustained, which is why prayer is a daily event, not a weekly event, then you can begin to have a conversation that starts to enlarge and you're actually carrying something that God is depositing both within and bringing to the earth, but first establishing inside. And the satisfaction causes rest. And we're not striving. And what we were seeking, I need somebody to see me. I need somebody to hear me. I need life. I need justice. I need vindication. It just goes away. Because Jesus becomes all of these things. And when he becomes all of this, we have rest. We cease from our labor. We don't have to actually worry about things. I pray this simple little prayer these days. I say, Lord, I'm bringing all of me inside of all of you. All of my journey, all of my life, all of my dreams, all of my hopes, all of my sins, all of my problems, everything I bring inside of you. And here you are, my high priest, in the presence of my Father, who sits on the throne of grace and who you sit next to. And I just know that as I stand here before you, you are addressing and will continue to be the resolution to everything. So I say to you that you are my hope, you are my joy, you are my peace, you are my healing, you are my deliverance, you are my salvation. And my faith is no longer looking at the problem to get it to change or looking to God to get the victory for the problem. My, my, my faith is just, just seeing how many ways can I begin to experience Jesus in entirety. Sometimes I forget the things that I really wish would change because they seem to be so minimal. They seem to be like, well, they're just... And sometimes the Lord speaks and says, you know what, Steve? We're just going to pour more grace on the thing. My grace is sufficient. I'm just going to dump more grace on you. I'm not going to resolve it the way you'd like it. I'm not going to deliver you the way you want it. I'm just going to dump more grace on it. But by the grace that I dump on it, I will inf increase the effectiveness of my life in you. Then you go, all right, whatever. I mean, who really wants that? But I want you. See, that's what we were, we were connect, we were drawn to him because something happened inside of us when we heard the gospel, the word of truth. The word of truth is Jesus Christ. And now we just, there is a journey that is just being, right? It's like we're just getting ready to journey into the, into the future. And that's why I believe there's, there's a new grace for prayer. So if you'll stand up with me, I want to pray a simple prayer. 
Thank you for listening on this. I have so much to share with you, and I just can't wait as we increase this level of prayer in each of our lives. I know the, act, the, the, the hearing will increase, the capacity to go, whoa, yeah, and the pull will increase. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the hour of power. It has always been and always will be the hour we spend in your presence inside of truth through the veil that Christ created to the priest that he became through the confession that he gives us and the becoming one there. In the name of Jesus, I release the grace to pray and not to pray old prayers and old practices of which we try to do gymnastics to make God pleased. You're not pleased when we pray if just because we prayed. You're pleased when we come into and through the veil and through truth and through the yielded, surrendered position, and through the honest conversation, and through holding a confession, and entering in to the throne of grace. You're pleased when we, we access and take advantage of what your son Jesus has accomplished. So in the name of Jesus, though this may be foreign to us, or it may be just something we let go for a season, I now call forth an activation, where prayer becomes like an illumination, where it's a light ball breaking forth, the day dawning, a morning star rising, the small word of promise, it's just like a flicker of light begins to come alive every time we pray. I declare by the Holy Spirit, who is the one who moves in us and with us, and from heaven to earth and earth to heaven, that there comes uh, wind and movement and truth and illumination and remembrance, and of Jesus said, I declare that the calling of God that each of us are called into and the inheritance of God that he has inside of each one of us, the calling of God into sonship in Jesus, the inheritance that we have inside of Christ begins to be illuminated in our prayer time. We don't have someone telling us who we are. We don't tell, especially not someone say, join my club so you can be it. We are a people of God purchased by Christ, redeemed by his blood. We are there for fully forgiven and fully redeemed and we're accessing for ourselves in Christ, through Christ, who we have become in Christ. I declare this breaking forth. I declare satisfaction in prayer that makes our life, whatever we've been asked to walk through, whatever we've been walking through, to be meaningless in light of the glory of the revelation of Jesus Christ. I declare that it, your satisfaction becomes so great that it becomes the source of all. And contentment overtakes every situation that we're asked to, to wait for you in. And when long-suffering is required, or forbearance is required, or goodness is required, or patience is required, it is not from ourself that we pull this up. We don't go to our will, and we don't go to our flesh, but we come back to you, and we allow you to be our patience, and our faith, and our love. And In the name of Jesus, now it begins. And Lord, I thank you that tomorrow it will be accessible and we will step in there and next day. And when we miss a day, we won't worry about it. Just get back up. And if we don't have an hour, that's okay. We'll get back on it. We don't make up days we miss. We don't make up time we miss. We're not a make up people. We are a victorious people in Jesus Christ. We're just picking up what we've been given and accessing what we've been told to go to. So we will occupy, we will possess, we will move into the fullness of what Jesus did. And we will allow you to be the resource of that. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys.